Uh, so if some people aren't here, they can get access to this. All right, doesn't look like there's any questions. And so I will, I will plug ahead here. Uh, and so uh, we are working on uh, the Civil War, but this week is gonna be primarily on reconstruction. All right, and so what I wanna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen because I got a few thoughts I wanna share about uh, reconstruction with you or just the ending of the war. Uh, today, you should have completed Civil War outcomes. And so uh, we want to uh, try to make sense of that and then be able to uh, move forward into a very difficult, difficult time period. So let me just share a few thoughts here with you. So let me get my screen going here, provided it works. Looks like Schoology is having some issues here. I'm on. All right. There we go. All right, so let's dismiss that one. All right. Nope. Let's let's try this one more time. I love it. Here we go. All right, we can do it. All right, so I've got a few thoughts here I want to share with you about the, the end of the Civil War, and I want to tie in um, some of the outcomes uh, that uh, you were looking at, see if I can do that as well here. Um, I'll try to be brief as that, but when it comes to the Civil War, I can I can talk for a very, very long time, but I won't do that. I'll try to keep it in 15 minutes here. So we're on the eve of Reconstruction, and when we talk about Reconstruction, it's the post-Civil War period, 1865 to 1877. Um, and uh, if we want to look at uh, an election that uh, the outcome wasn't determined for a very long time. It would be the election of 1876 that brought the end of Reconstruction. Um, that, that election wasn't decided uh, until, I want to say, February of 1877. Uh, and we used to always inaugurate our president in, uh, in March. So it got very, very, very close uh, to that. So if you think this election outcome is at is, is a little bit longer, um, well, you gotta look at the 1876 election, but I do digress. Civil War, eve of reconstruction here. Um, one looks at the United States in 1865 as a uh, crisis state. Uh, we are in a state of crisis after uh, the Civil War. And what does that really mean? Uh, uh, if we put it in military casualties, you know, we talk about um, uh, 620,000 uh, 620, Americans are dead, 360,000 of them are Union, 260,000 are Confederate. We have about 375 seriously wounded or maimed. And so uh, if we put that in statistics numbers, um, one in 15 uh, males in the United States are, are impacted um, by this war. We look at the physical and economic crisis that we're in, the South is completely devastated. It's railroad and industry and some major cities are in ruins. And so uh, like Richmond and Atlanta, um, being some major cities, um, Birmingham is in there, New Orleans, uh, Memphis, uh, those cities, they're devastated. Fields and livestock in, uh, are wasted, be, uh, especially when you look at an example in Georgia with um, Sherman's Atlanta campaign, um, utter destruction of, of Georgia. Uh, if, you could, if they couldn't take it, they destroyed it, they killed it, uh, they burned it. Uh, and so fields and livestock uh, being wasted here. Uh, if we look at a constitutional crisis, we have uh, the idea of what to do with 11 Confederate states that are not part of the Union, but that's a matter of perception. Remember, Abraham Lincoln did not necessarily view that they left the Union. 
uh, Confederate states do view themselves as ha having leave the Union, and uh, some members of Congress had viewed them as leaving the Union. So their status is unclear and uh, future status uncertain. Some think just break out the pink pearl eraser, erase all the borders and redraw them. So we've got, we've got some issues there. Political crisis, the Republican Party is dominant in Congress now, and the former Democratic slaveholder uh, uh, is in the White House here, and that's Andrew Johnson. And so if we want to look for a person who is not the ideal individual to lead the United States at this critical time period, it's Andrew Johnson. And remember, Andrew Johnson is going to become president of the United States um, because Abraham Lincoln uh, gets assassinated. And so um, an unlikely an unlikely person to get into the White House. And so he is definitely going to have an impact on, on Reconstruction here. All right. Um, as I'm talking, if you have a question or anything, just please um, interject if you can, if you want to. More than welcome. Socially, we look at 4 million freedmen throughout the South. So these ex-slaves now need to um, be, in some ways, folded into society. And that's going to play out in Reconstruction. You have demobilized Confederate soldiers. And what, uh, what should happen to them? And you have displaced uh, white families. All right. And so what that is referencing is um, uh, slave owners now are displaced. Their property has been uh, in some ways confiscated by the federal government. And um, that status is in doubt. Um, one of the controversies in Reconstruction, though, is many of them will get their property back. And um, that will set up some problems uh, down the road. Psychologically, if we look at the United States, uh, and especially in... Got a, little, got a little excited there, um, especially in the South, um, you got some psychological crisis. There's a lot of resentment, bitterness, anger, despair. They feel as they're being occupied because the federal troops are still there. Um, they don't necessarily feel part of the United States. And so that's going to take some time. It's going to take a lot of time to, to work on that. All right. So ultimately, you know, why, why did the Confederacy lose, all right? So if you look at some of those battles, Antietam, Gettysburg, Vicksburg, the Atlanta campaign, they in, in, in some ways are going to contribute to why did the South lose, all right? So they had some missed opportunities on the battlefield. Uh, they didn't get the foreign support that they were looking for. Really what they talk about foreign support here is more um, – one, recognition that they are a legitimate country, and two, um, getting badly needed resources. You can argue that they did get some resources from uh, Great Britain, um, when we're talking about military resources, um, but diplomatically, France, Great Britain did not recognize uh, the Confederacy as an independent country. So battles like Antietam and Gettysburg really set them back in, in that area. Um, Vicksburg and uh, the Atlanta campaign just simply show that uh, the nature of the war is changing and uh, the Confederacy is not going to be able to really compete. Political leadership here, uh, Jefferson Davis is the president of uh, the Confederacy. He was not the easiest individual to work with, always had a revolving door of um, cabinet officers, seem to always argue with Confederate um, governors. Uh, he was, again, very difficult, did not figure out a way to govern with consents, with consensus. Um, military leadership, I think, as you know, we started this, um, I think acknowledged that, yeah, the, the, the Confederacy may have some brilliant military generals like Robert E. Lee and Longstreet, um, PGT Beauregard, uh, Stonewall Jackson, the list can go on and on. Um, but they also have tremendous egos, and they're very difficult uh, to work with and coordinate things with. Uh, and 
sometimes that that definitely would would get in, get into the way, especially being able to work with Jefferson Davis. Uh, they struggle to really have a national um, strategy here. Uh, the economy simply collapsed. The again, I got a little excited here. Um, the economy had collapsed. Cotton did not prove to be king. The blockade that was set up, because uh, that was part of the military strategy of the United States with the Anaconda Plan, uh, was to place a blockade. That really hurt the economy, especially by 1863 and 64. And then with the Emancipation Proclamation uh, that was coming out of as a result of Antietam and then issued and become final in – become – in effect in uh, January of 1863, the, the, uh, the enslaved people just simply uh, walked off plantations. And so that contributed to the economic co collapse. The Confederate will um, could only go so, so far and will is more like the cause that we're talking about here, um, independence uh, and um, fighting for home and uh, hearth and home uh, that can only last so so long because this turned into a modern war, a war of attrition. Uh, it really uh, zapped uh, their their will to continue to fight. And so by 1865, uh, you could get a sense that the Confederates were uh, were de were defeated. So why did the United States win? Well, it could come down again to the, the resources. If we think back to the strengths and weakness activity, um, it does come down to the economy. Uh, the industrial complex with the, with the manpower uh, proved to be a very potent uh, force to be reckoned with. Uh, plus you have to take a look at Lincoln's leadership. He was able to govern with consensus. He was able to work with his opponents uh, and he just seemed to have uh, the gift to be able to lead the country through a crisis moment, say the right things at the right time. Uh, and plus, you know, you got like Lincoln, he, he knows how to give speeches that don't last uh, epically long. I mean, Gettysburg address uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg is only two minutes long. You know, he, he, he summarizes everything about the war in those two minutes and what needs to happen. Uh, so Gettysburg and his address, um, all that represents kind of a, a turning point. Of course, military leadership as well. Um, you know, the United States may not have the, uh, the, the more recognizable um, generals, but they proved to be very capable and they could also learn on the job. Uh, some good ones stood out, you know, Grant, Sherman, Meade, Sheridan, uh, McPherson, um, Buford, the, the list can grow as well. And uh, the United States military leadership uh, could seem to uh, work together and with Lincoln um, be able to have a coordinated national strategy. Uh, if, if, if Lincoln couldn't work with the military commander, he might simply fire them or demote them. And he'll do that until he gets the, the right, right um, team together. So um, battlefield success is going to be important here as well. And, you, you know, we, we saw that definitely being demonstrated in those four battles that um, is associated with the Civil War outcome. Uh, but that's through time. Successes did not happen right away. 1861 and early 1862, a lot of setbacks for the United States. And then they started getting things um going in their direction and starting getting it to become um, more in the United States um, favor. And that again, maybe is because of the economy, maybe because of the manpower, mainly because they could be fighting, finding the military leaderships, but battlefield successes was happening here as well as for the Confederates, uh, the lack of resources uh, and manpower were starting to play, play a, a role here. And it turned into a war of attrition again, as you can see from like that image there. Uh, Richmond is a, is, is a burned out city here. Uh, war of attrition, take the war uh, to the people, uh, grind it out, uh, use uh, multiple of methods 
to uh, get the end results. And so, again, this really does look like a modern day war. All right. And the Union will. Uh, again, it seems like the Confederacy might have had a cause, but uh, the Union will to continue to fight uh, grew throughout the war and strengthened throughout, uh, throughout the war. And so by 1865, the United States is moving in that, uh, that direction to have success. And it all has to do with uh, the Union uh, will and, and grit and willing to, to fight fight this out and, and have uh, some success. So impact here, I just want to focus a little bit on the impact and then pop in and, and begin to look at reconstruction here. But what does this war really mean here? You know, that's ultimately what we're getting at the impact. Well, one, abolition of slavery. That's a guarantee. 13th Amendment had been passed in January of 65 and ratified by the required amount of states by December of 65. Civil War solved that. Slavery is done. 13th Amendment. The permanency of the Union. Uh, so basically the federal government wins out. Decline of states' rights. There are political changes and the Republican Party becomes a dominant party and they will be dominant at the national level for a number of decades. Social changes, the social structure is redefined. Um, social mobility wins the day. Um, so that's going to really impact um, if we look at Southern society, the social structure changes. Uh, the, the old saying now, bottom rail on top. Now, um, in former enslaved people, freedmen are brought into the fold here. And so the social structure changes. And then economic changes. It's a triumph of industrialism. So for the rest of the 19th century, the United States is going to move in a more industrial direction. And that will also bring in agriculture and um and for the uh, South, uh, the agricultural system is going to have to readjust as well. So Civil War has some pretty big impacts here. All right. So that's with that. Does anyone have any questions on that? All right. So um, I have a little video clip here that's going to uh, introduce some um, why we should study reconstruction. So I'll play that. And so we'll see how that, um, see how that works here. But um, reconstruction is, is a very important time period for us, trying to figure out how we can put this country back uh, together. How we can put this country back together. And, um, and, and what that means is politically, socially, and economically put this country back together here. And, uh, and how long Reconstruction should last and who's in control of it. Uh, one could make a claim if Reconstruction really put the country back together, uh, why would we still have some issues that played out in the 20th century like civil rights movement? So got to keep that also in the back of your mind here. So let's, without further ado, let me just bring up this um, video clip here. And uh, can someone tell me if they see this screen? I can see it. All right, super. All right, so here we got, we're, we got some historians are going to tell us why studying reconstruction is important. And we're going to call that historiography. And that's also another skill that um, we'll be working on. Um, periodically uh, um, as we, we study U.S. history as well here. So here we go. Let's give this a shot. We're never fully going to understand who are you, who am I, how did we get here, what are the problems that we're facing, unless we understand the histories that produce that. Reconstruction, to my mind, is the most vital period of American history. 
people were making history, uh, you know, out of the ashes of, of war, creating an entirely new country. Transfer from slavery to political liberty practically overnight never happened anywhere else in, in history. This was a bold set of aspirations. And it set in motion civil rights, notions of equal citizenship, the empowerment of black people, the idea that white people and black people could work together, could live together, could govern together, could love together in a way that was unprecedented in American history. That was not going to be accomplished in 15 years, but it set in motion a series of things that we're still wrestling with today as a society. Who is a citizen? What should the rights of citizens be? What are the relationships between the federal government and the state governments? How do you deal with terrorism? That's a reconstruction issue. Those central questions of who is an American, what does it mean to be an American, and what is the American government, and therefore what is America, are really laid down from 1865 forward. But all of this was happening in a society that had to face this, try to deal with this, define all of this practically overnight in the wake of an all-out war. It's a story of how ordinary people facing very difficult odds uh, tried to create a better society, try to create a functioning democracy, try to create a semblance of equality in this country. In its highs and its lows, and its tragedy, its corruption, it's just a remarkable story, and every student of American history should know it. Okay. All right. So, um, so realistically, the, the point of, if, if we look at that clip there, uh, in many ways, the point of uh, the importance of reconstruction. And so over these next few days, we're really going to look at, and I'm going to have you dig in and look at the importance of reconstruction. Uh, but one of the things, the big task before we can even put the country together, um, you're going to have competing interests to figure out um, who is in charge of running Reconstruction? Is it the President of the United States? Is it Congress? Or is it the, uh, the defeated ex-Confederate uh, states? Um, do they control Reconstruction? Or is it a combination of all that? So you're going to have some political jockeying to figure out who's in charge. And then um, once that's established, what kind of plans are they going to put um, put in place? And then uh, about citizenship. In that little clip, it talked about citizenship. And so when we look at um, when we look at uh, who is an American. Um, it's really being uh, defined here during this time period. Uh, the 14th Amendment is going to really establish who is a U.S. citizen. And, um, you know, that's going to at least begin to kind of start that conversation. And then it's expanded uh, throughout the, the 19th and into the 20th century. Okay. So, Reconstruction, as the video, and, and as I'm trying to say, it's just a very critical, critical time period. All right, for us, um, the assignment is going to, I'm going to have you look at the various reconstruction plans. So if you can go into Schoology and open up uh, the reconstruction plans assignment, which is already there. Oh, no, looks, Evan, Evan's already got it done. Um, it's going to look something like this. All right. And this is a solo activity. So, um, if you, if you don't, if you're not able to, to get this or able to, 
to find it, please let me know. Uh, really what we're looking at here is what are the different plans and then ultimately um, was it successful? Was it successful? And again, that's an arbitrary thing, um, but we can, we can say that reconstruction had success. We can also say that reconstruction may have had, uh, may have not had success. And those historians in that clip, uh, they have a, a, a way, uh, just a, a range of, of thought on it as well. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna create a flow chart, very similar to what you see down here. Do that in Schoology. You can make these boxes as big as you, you need to, because I know some of you are gonna be uh, really thorough and, and others just terse and to the point. But what you wanna look at is, um, these four groups, people, and find out what their, their thoughts are on reconstruction and what was their plans for um, reconstruction. Could that include readmitting former Confederate states? Could that uh, involve what to do with uh, the Confederate officials and officers? And does that involve helping uh, freed African-Americans, all right? The freedmen, as they sometimes are referred to in that time period. And then also, what who is the biggest challenge, opposition to certain individual or groups and why? So all that needs to be addressed for Lincoln, Johnson, Congress, and the South. And you put that inside these boxes. And then the last one is the, the BHQs, uh, the big historical questions, the summary type questions. Um, why did Reconstruction come to an end? And to what extent was Reconstruction a success? All right, so you need to look at uh, Lincoln, Johnson, Congress, and sometimes we refer to Congress as radical Congress or the congressional plan. So you might wanna make a note of that. Um, and radicals are being actually referred to as Republicans uh, of that era. So you might be a little confused with uh, some of the terms being used and um, political parties of the 19th century may not necessarily reflect the political parties of the 20th century. And the New South, that is just referencing uh, the change that's going to be happening in the, the 11 ex-Confederate states and um, what their thoughts might be on some of these issues up there. You'll also notice here, a uh, last thing here is a PDF on reconstruction articles. I'd use that, but then I would also use chapter 22 in my textbook as well. Okay. All right. So with that, do we have, um, any particular questions or anything that needs to get clarified, please let me know right now. Or you can put it in the chat or you can give me a question. Does it sound like we can do this? Just need someone to tell me yes or no. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There we go. I think it is very, very doable. Um, but it is important to know that getting reconstruction, there are competing interests. Uh, and that can either help or hurt the success of, of reconstruction. Okay. So with that said, um, I'm done with uh, my part of, of this. And so it is perfectly acceptable for you to leave and work on this assignment. And it is due for tomorrow. No, excuse me, due Wednesday. Okay. Um, tomorrow, I will probably take some time to uh, talk a little bit about some of the plans at the beginning of the class period, but then also uh, give you some good time to work on this as well. Okay. So if there's no questions, you're more than welcome to leave.